wife and helped him operate the machinery uh, here. So uh, uh, join me and welcome Kendall uh, to talk about uh, the baby. Thank you, Dr. Lacefield. Uh, I've been doing baleage for 18 years now, learned a few things to do right and a few things to do wrong. So I want to highlight some keys here on making baleage. Proper moisture is extremely important. We've got a range that we can work with, 40 to 65 percent, but I want to zero in on that and actually get it down to 45 to 55 percent range. It's important to have enough moisture for fermentation to work, but yet you don't want too much moisture that you can have butyric acid formation. Also, if you have too little uh, moisture, you can invite mold growth, and like I say, the too much with butyric acid. A way to compare that is a diesel engine, if it has a plug fuel filter, that engine's still going to run, but it's not going to run under full power. So the moisture is the same as the diesel fuel as far as the fermentation process. So we have to have enough for it to work and let it work properly. Your bales need to be uniform in shape. That's extremely important. The uh, square bales, they need to be filled well from the top to the bottom and get the corners filled up. Round bales need to be filled equally on both sides and you don't want to have a cone-shaped bale. We have a, a small example here where the bale is tapered a little bit and usually on that uh, softer side you're going to have some trapped air and it's that air is the enemy of the fermentation process. They need to be as tight as possible to ex exclude as much air as possible. Here we have an example and even though it is a uh, dry hay bale but you can see here where that bale is not, not packed tight at all and there's going to be a lot of air in there. I've found with the uh, mid-sized square bales that I'm using that if I'm using at least a 440 twine it helps to minimize broken twine and knotter problems especially when I want to pack the bales extra tight there again to force out as much air as possible. Very important to keep the dirt out of your hay. While you're cutting, while you're raking, set the rakes heights accordingly to stay up out of the dirt. The dirt is going to have is ash and it's that ash in your lab analysis and uh, more dirt is going to reduce feed intake. I think the rule of thumb is that for every 1% extra ash over 10% you're going to reduce feed intake 2%. I've seen some lab analysis at 20% ash. So you take that 10% times 2, that's 20% reduced feed intake, and that makes a big difference on animal uh, gain or milk production. Wheel rakes are great for dry hay. They are not good on a baleage system because the teeth are going to drag on the ground. They're going to mix in uh, some level of dirt, and that dirt contains Clostridia bacteria, and that Clostridia, simply put, is a bad bug. Also, when you're baling, you need to have the baler pickup height set to stay up out of the dirt. It's better to leave just a scrap of hay here and there than it is to get it all and then get the dirt that comes with those few little scraps. <clears throat> when you're uh, getting ready to wrap on choosing plastic, you want a very high quality stretch film. There's lots of different films out there and there's lots of different qualities. It's extremely important with square bales to have one with a really good quality because that plastic is going to get stretched extra as it comes over the corner of the bale. Uh, you need a film with a good high quality tackifier and uh, to get the layers of the plastic to stick together to prevent air from getting in. Some plastics have the tackifier on both sides so they get a better seal. There's also some plastics now that have an air infiltration rating. Uh, this is somewhat new in the industry. Uh, the pit silo guys are starting to have their plastics rated. Uh, the stretch film is just starting to look at this a little bit, so it is new. But basically what they're telling you, the better plastic is going to have a lower number, which means the plastic is less porous and you're not going to have the air going through the plastic. Therefore, you're going to have a better seal on your bales. In the wrapping process, it's very important 
and ideally to be done wrapping within three hours of when that last bale was made. Now we've got a chart here showing at 36% moisture that if we're at zero hours, we're down here on the bottom bar and we're preventing heating as much as possible and getting a good fermentation process. And 36 is really the low end of where we need to be. This other chart at the high end at 63%, pretty much the same thing. Zero hours, we're down here on the lower end of the graph and we're getting a better fermentation profile by wrapping it a lot faster as opposed to anything that's delayed. And then you can see how much extra heating we get. And that extra heating is just causing um, possible spoilage and also heat damage to the product itself. In the staging area, uh, I wrap a lot of it out in the, I don't want to wrap out in the field. I wrap up by the gateway uh, so it's handy to uh, get it loaded up and transported at a later date. Wrapping out in the field, the stubble can pull coals out in the field. Now I have had that occasion where I've had to wrap out in the field uh, because the field was just too wet, rain impending or whatever. Uh, but then we'll take and bring the bales up and usually rewrap them or else get them marketed right away so that there is any holes in the plastic or don't have problems with spoilage. A minimum of eight layers is recommended. I tried six layers at one time and you just don't get a good enough seal with six layers of plastic. We've got a lot of lines on this chart here and the take home message is to get out, they're saying eight mils and most plastic is one mil. So we're looking at eight layers of plastic to get into the middle of this group of lines down here so that you get a good seal on the uh, bale so we keep the internal temperatures down and minimize or eliminate heating loss. Okay, wrapping process, uh, looking at individual bale wrap versus the tube line. Uh, saw this place here where they wanted to uh, wrap some tubes in a tube line around the building site and make a snow fence. Well, it probably worked fairly well as a snow fence. It did not work for storage of their product, as we can see right here, where the plastic pulled apart, so they're going to have spoilage on both sides there. It's a little hard to see in this picture, but you can see the bales are not uniform in shape, so they've got some soft spots in the bales. And wrapping that tight around the buildings like that, the bales aren't packed together end to end, so they've got more trapped air in there, an opportunity for mold or uh, compost to form. Then they tried to plug it here in the middle where they were going to drive through and very obvious here that they used a larger dry bale to try and seal the end. Well, that dry bale has got air in it and it's also porous, so there's going to be more infiltrate in there and it's going to cause spoilage and cause problems for them. So that's not going to work the best. Uh, inoculants, and I'm going to separate it versus uh, preservatives a little bit. And generally speaking, a good inoculant will speed up the fermentation process. Some bugs are fast and are going to give you better fermentation. You're going to get a faster pH drop, minimal dry matter loss, and low heating, if any. Some bugs are slow. You're going to get a poor fermentation, slow pH drop, large dry matter loss, and high heating of the forage. And that heating, uh, for those bugs to create that heat, they're consuming dry matter. 25 minute versus 60 hour bugs. A lot of people say, well, I've got lactobacillus bacteria in my inoculant. Well, that's great, but there's thousands of kinds of lactobacillus bacteria. Some of them will reproduce and double in 25 minutes. Some of them are very lazy, and it might take them 60 hours to reproduce and double. So a lazy bug like that versus an active one isn't good. You want one that's going to be very active, which then also gets down to the number of initial bugs that you apply when you're putting the inoculant on your forage. If you've got billions of lazy bugs, that isn't going to do any good versus a lower number of one that's very active and is going to make up the difference in a very short order of time. Also, you have to watch out about viable versus non-viable bugs. Simply put, that's alive ones versus dead ones. Dead ones in the forage isn't going to do you any good. That's like putting a dead bull out with the heifers. He's not going to do you any good. <clears throat> okay, a uh, little research here. Um, I worked with Agri King and they provided this data back as a result uh, where we were trying a, an inoculant and we used a Silo King treated versus the untreated. 
And these were conditions where we had optimum baling, optimum forage, and wrapping and everything. So it was the best that we could do. So even though we were doing things well, you can see a difference in the dry matter loss on a percentage basis or pounds, a little difference in the pH. But the big thing here, the take home message, is look at the difference in the clostridia of the mold and the yeast colony forming units per gram. And that was doing it, trying to do it correctly. Somebody who's a little less interested in doing it correctly or doesn't understand all the chemistry involved and gets it too dry or too late or dirt mixed in or whatever, those numbers could explode uh, exponentially. A lot of preservatives on the market are kind of simply put, we heard some uh, information on those here a little bit ago, uh, but I kind of grouped it into like propionic acid, anhydrous ammonia, or urea. The anhydrous ammonia and the urea aren't used but very little anymore, mostly because of the handling problems, safety issues, and it can be hard on the equipment. Preservatives, as a rule, are not meant for baleage. The preservative mode of action is to kill the bugs, and they don't differentiate between the good bugs and the bad bugs, and that's important that we have the good ones working for us. So in order uh, for baleage to ferment, we need the good bugs, and we need them to be alive, and we need them to be very active. Also, some preservatives will vaporize at feed out, so that allows the bad bacteria to grow before that feed is consumed, and then it's going to start making mold or compost. <clears throat> Sampling for quality analysis, the sample of the hay before wrapping, I feel is very important. You're going to get a more uniform sample and you're not poking holes in the plastic. As we bring a loads up to get them unloaded and wrapped, I'll tell the fellows, depending on the size of the field, how many bales we're going to have, we're going to sample three or four bales out of 16 or 20 that come up. So we know during the whole field bringing in, we've got a uniform representative sample of that field. And we know then, and my customers know, that it was a fresh sample that we pulled. Uh, we're going to have a lab analysis showing what that sample was. And then if they want to resample when they're ready to feed it out to see what the changes were and fine tune their ration accordingly, then they can do that. In storage, you need a well-drained area. You need to keep the weeds and the grass out. Um, that helps keep out the mice. And I've found that it's very important uh, down the side of the bales or in between about every two or three rows to put a bait station there to feed the mice because otherwise they're going to get in there and cause havoc. They're going to dig into the bales, open them up, allow air in, and allow spoilage. And you can see here, too, how we've got them stacked up uh, close together. It takes a minimal amount of storage that way. Um, we like to keep them. Here we've got a road here. Uh, keep them up near the road so it's easy to access during the wintertime, but also it helps to discourage deer and raccoons. We've got lots of deer around. I've not had deer problems. And just this last uh, year and a half ago, uh, two years ago on crop, that we had raccoons get into some stuff and they tore up about 60 bales on me. I got that sucker. So, okay, tube line storage. Um, takes a lot more room. You've got issues with the bales being uncovered on the ends. Uh, the back up one. And here we can see, you know, they got a nice job of getting them parallel, but there's still quite a bit of space in between to get the machine down in there. And, um, you can only go one layer high, whereas I can stack them higher, take up a lot less room. Here again, we can see where the bales are open on the end, the plastic pulled apart in the middle. Uh, so storage with a tube line wrapping system, it can be done, but you've got to be real diligent and know some of the uh, problems that can uh, surface uh, on storage like that. So in summary, baleage made right can be a near perfect feed. You've got all the advantages of the long stems, which promotes cud chewing uh, for the animal. You've got the benefits of fermentation, which starts the digestive process on that forage and makes it more palatable and more digestible for the animal. Nothing overcomes bad management. Baleage or any wet feed naturally wants to turn into compost. So it's critical to keep the dirt out, which has the clostridia bacteria on it, 
It's also critical to keep the air out during baling, wrapping, and during storage. Any questions? Time for a quick question. One in the back. Here. One back here. What I do on the moisture, I've got a Coster uh, air dr forage dryer, and I can uh, t use that to dry a sample down to know where I'm at, getting ready to rake or getting ready to bale. Now, I've got enough years of experience and over, well over 100,000 bales that just by putting that sample in that drying bucket, if it's this full, I know I'm too wet. If it's a third full, I know it's past time to get the rakes going and start the baler right behind it. But I have a wide window of moisture that I can work with on harvesting, so it's not as critical as dry hay where you really got to get down to a narrower moisture range. Okay, one more right question. here. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I've been fortunate. I've not had any vandalism on them yet. Let's give Kendall and Catherine a big round of applause. Did a great job. Thank you.